Please have your copy of God's Word open to um, 1 Peter chapter number 4 as we continue our verse-by-verse -verse study of this particular epistle. And our text for today, as I said, is 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. And the title of today's message is Suffering for God's Glory, Suffering for God's Glory. Now, at the time of the writing of this particular letter, which was about 30 years after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, Christianity was spreading so fast throughout the Roman Empire, it was becoming a threat to the Roman government as well as to the Jewish religious leaders. The Romans were polytheistic, meaning they believed there were many gods and they thought all gods were equal. Christianity, of course, is monotheistic, meaning there's only one God who is Lord over all. He's the ruler of all. And so when the Christians refused to worship the false gods that they had formerly worshipped, and they refused to bow before the Roman emperor as God, meaning that reserved that position was reserved totally for the Lord. They were accused of undermining the Roman government. And an order was given to persecute the Christians and to squelch the rebellion. And of course we're seeing the same tactics used by the United States government today and governments all over the world to squelch the rise up of Christians. If you want to go back and read some bloody history, go back and read the first uh, 300 years of Christianity, you'll find nothing but, but blood-stained Christians all throughout the history. So what we're going to experience at the end of the church age is quite the same as what they experienced at the beginning. Now to escape the persecution, many Christians fled to the remote provinces of Rome. You can find the cities there mentioned in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 through 11. And, uh, but what happened when, when Christianity began to grow and spread there in those Roman provinces, the same thing happened as it happened in the city of Rome. It began to increase in persecution. They sent word to the Apostle Peter with a question, how should we then live? How can we face such persecution? How can, how can we continue to manifest the Christian faith if we're going to face such persecution? And uh, Peter, who probably led some of these people to the Lord to begin with, didn't console them at all. He said, uh, here's, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get your mind off of those who are persecuting you. And I want you to get your mind on the one who purchased you with his blood. Amen. Let me repeat that to you, Christian. Get your minds off of those who are persecuting us. And get your mind on the one who purchased us with his precious blood. If you haven't underscored it, dotted it with something lips dip, mascara, whatever. Chapter 2, verse 21. Chapter 2, verse 21. Here is the theme of the, ver of the whole passage. He says, to this kind of suffering you've been called. I know that's contrary to what you've been here. To this kind of suffering you have been called because Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in His steps. Here's the point. Through Christ's unjust suffering and His unjust death, we have been saved from an eternity of suffering in hell. And it could very well be that through our unjust suffering and our unjust death, if it comes to that, others will see Christ in us and also be saved as well. And therefore that call to suffering was issued to every Christian of every age of every era. And the 21st Christians are no different from anybody else. I was telling my friend Gerald Harris last night, or texting him last night, I'm not sure the 21st century Christians are going to accept persecution like the 1st century did. I'm not sure we're ready for that. 2 Timothy 3.12, the Apostle Paul warned us, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus shall be persecuted, will suffer persecution. And the fact that Christians in the West have not suffered such physical persecution as Christians in many other parts of the world leads me to conclude, not only are we not as serious about, um, uh, about being the salt of the earth and about being the light of the world, not only are we... Um, not as dedicated as they are about exposing the works of evil and seeing men and women set free from the bondage of sin. Not only are we not as committed as they are about reaching the unreached with, uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ, but for the last 50 years, probably even 60, Christians in the West have been told, why, if you're suffering, it's, um, it's because you don't have enough faith in God. If you're suffering, it's because you've got some sin in your life that you will not confess or <coughs> repent. And um, because if something's wrong in your life, it's because of your faith. It's a lack of faith. Well, the Christian life to them is one of success, not suffering. The Christian life to them is one of purpose, not persecution. 
The Christian life to them is one of power and position, certainly not politeness and submission. For God wants us to be healthy and wealthy and worldly wise. That's the message of Christianity for the last 50 years, right? That's what we've been told. Well, guess what? It was a it was a lie sold on the fire from the gates of hell. It was at the beginning, it is now, and it will be the next time it's shared. That's not the Christian faith. That's why the church in the West is so much weaker spiritually than it is in those areas where there is suffering persecution. I don't challenge you hearing me, but I want you to make sure you hear the next few words. So if you're listening, say a loud amen this morning. Amen. The fastest growing church in the world today is in Iran. Let that sink in. Christianity is spreading like wildfire in that region. They don't know what to do with it. According to the report from the Frontier Alliance International, thousands of Muslims are walking away from Islam and embracing Christianity. That's worth at least another amen this morning. They don't know what to do with it over there, folks. In fact, some Iranian Christians believe Islam is dead in Iran. In fact, because the, the, the Muslim mosques are empty. The Christian church in Iran is without building, without property, without core leadership. But the body of believers continues to grow. Here's what I want you to hear. Not by church planting, but by making disciples. I think I read that somewhere in the scriptures. I think Jesus may have said that, right? I think I'm right about that. It's in your study guide. Why does that work? It's in the little box. Converts run from persecution but disciples are willing to forsake the world and cling to Jesus even if they have to die for him. End of quote. Oh, that our denominational leaders would not only confess that but repent of it because this man-centric, seeker-sensitive church growth philosophy has all but destroyed the evangelical church in America. Amen. And beloved, one more program is not going to, you can't just sweep all this stuff under the rug. That has to be confessed. As man-centric, it has to be confessed as selfishness and self-centeredness and narcissistic as it is. And then maybe God will see fit to bless us going forward. But until we confess that sin, how can we ask God to bless us going forward? We don't preach to fill up a church. We preach to change the hearts of those who hear the Word of God. By the way, the Iranian awakening is led by women. And while it's underground, they are aware of what's going to happen to them if they get exposed and caught. Let me give you the quote here. Quote, we know that if they get us, the first thing they will do is rape us. Then they will beat us and ultimately kill us. But this is the decision we have made. This is the risk we must take. We know when we leave our home, we may not come back. But as Jesus offered his body as a sacrifice for our sins, we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice unto him. End quote. Let that sink in today at lunch, please. More than 200 million Christians live in those countries where it's illegal or at best uneasy to be a Christian, and yet that's where Christianity is exploding. Let me make this clear. Christianity is dying in the West, but it's exploding in those areas where believers are suffering the greatest persecution. Why? Go back and read that block again. Converts run from the first whimper, the first sign, the first evidence of persecution. But disciples are willing to forsake all and follow Christ even to their death. And I believe God is going to use the rise of persecution in America to separate two things. The true believers from the false confessors. The true believers from the false confessors. And that's why these winds of chains are whipping across the United States today. Authoritarian governments have always viewed true Christianity as a threat to their perceived power, which is why they're very suspicious of anything other than a state religion or what might be called cultural Christianity. Years ago, William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, said the chief danger that confronted the West was, quote, a religion without the Holy Spirit, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, and heaven without hell, end of quote. My, how wise that man was. Cultural Christianity is a religion of self-righteousness and a religion of self-works, good works. And while the tenets of cultural Christianity are based upon the concept of the existence of God and the narrative of the person and the work of Jesus Christ, that's as far as it goes. There's no, there's no evidence of a personal relationship with God. 
Cult or Christianity follows the social norms of other Christians. So, as one generation relaxes sin in one area, the next generation adopts it as a new but lower standard. And that's why we are where we are in cultural Christianity today. However, if you follow these cultural Christians for long, there's no evidence of an abiding with Christ at all. These are the branches that sort of hang around the vine, but they never give any evidence of ever having been attached to the vine or wanting to be attached to the vine. They just want to be a part of the religious club. While there are many others, let me give you a few of the identifying marks of a casual or cultural Christian. Number one, they deny the inspiration of the Scriptures, especially those, that, um, those passages that deal with their particular sin, the sin that so easily besets them. They uh, focus on God's love rather than His holiness or His righteousness. Oh, a loving God is not going to send anybody else. And as far as my sin, well, you know, I know years ago they said that was wrong, but you know, we live in a different day today. How about they deny the need for true repentance as the evidence of salvation? Well, I, my family's been a part of this church. My children joined this church. We've filled out all the cards. We've been dumped in the pool. Well, we're as good to go as anybody. How about they deny the rapture of the church or the return of Christ? Oh, I, I, I've heard about those things, and maybe they'll happen someday, but certainly not in our day. Those things are a long way off. How do you know that? If, if the Bible says no one can know the hour or the day, then how do you know it's not today? Well, a true Christian is one who has received Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, and according to James 2.26, the essential evidence of one having received Christ as their Savior is that there is manifested a changed life. <laughs> a commitment to live by some level of moral convictions they will not compromise, and a commitment to live under the expectation that today could be the day that I meet my Savior face to face. And therefore, I'm going to live my life as close to Him as I can, because I don't want to have to far to go when He calls me. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus told His disciples, the crowds of them came to Him and said, Oh, remember Luke 9, you're at the beginning of His ministry, right? Oh, we want to follow you, Christ. We want to follow you. We'll follow you to the ends of the earth. And Jesus didn't turn around and say, Yay, I'm glad I got this band of followers and we can attack the world. No, what did you say? He said, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his own cross daily, and follow me. Whew, that'll thin the crowd in a hurry, won't it? What was Jesus going to do to obtain our eternal salvation? He was going to deny his deity. He was going to take up his cross. He was going to give his life for a ransom for our sins. So what does he ask us to do? What does he ask those who receive his gift of eternal salvation to do? Well, deny ourselves. <laughs> deny our rights. Deny our goals, our dreams, our desires. Take up our own cross daily. Not to die for our sins, but to die to the sin that put him on the cross. Die to those sins that put him on the cross. To die to our sin, to be willing to die for the one who saved us from our eternal suffering if necessary to prove our faith in the promise of our resurrection. You see, if I'm not willing to die when I'm called upon to die, then it means I don't believe that God can raise me from the dead. But because I know that God can raise me from the dead, bring it on, you can only do it once. The more serious we become about our faith in Christ, the more persecution we're going to suffer from those who don't know Christ, and the more persecution we're going to suffer from those who are carnal or casual Christians. Why? Because our commitment to live holiness is a conviction to their unholiness. Oh, you're one of those holy rollers. You're the goody two-shoes. You, you, you like to give us holy atmosphere. Well, no, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, but I, I, again, I want to live close to the Lord because I don't want to have far to go when He calls me. 1 Peter 3.14, even if you should suffer for righteousness, you will be blessed. Why? So have no fear of them or be troubled. Now let's begin with a little background here. What I believe is going to be a very eye-opening sermon and soul-stirring study of this passage today. We've divided it into two sections. We'll pick up with verse 12 next week. But first of all, we will remind you again, Peter wrote this amazing letter to the Christians who were living in a very hostile environment, something they'd never done before because they were a part of those, of the Jewish religious faith. They were, they were involved in the Judaism, so they didn't suffer persecution. Everybody was doing the same thing. Well, when they accepted Christ, they began to suffer persecution from their government, from Jewish religious leaders, from the people who were already involved in Judaism, their employers, their neighbors, their friends, their loved ones and their family. They, they were suffering persecution from all corners. 
But rather than lower their standards of righteousness to fit in or to compromise their convictions to get rid of their suffering, Peter said, look, you need to keep your focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. Continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. Continue to live your holy lives even if in doing so it increases your suffering. Why? Because God's going to use your suffering for your good and for His glory. God is going to use our suffering for our good and for His glory. Nail that down in your notes. James confirmed this in, in his first epistle. Let me encourage you to, to uh, memorize these words that I'm going to read to you. James says, count it all joy when you encounter or fall into various trials or temptations, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance or patience, whichever translation you have. But let patience have its perfect result or perfect work that you may be made perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. In other words, if God allows us to suffer for our faith, then don't try to avoid it. Don't try to get out of it. Don't compromise your convictions to, to cause it to go away. Don't try to squirm out of it some way. No, no, no. Let it happen, because God's going to use it for our good and for His glory. James went on to say, if any of you lack wisdom, in other words, if you want to know why you're suffering, then ask God. God, why are you allowing this to happen to me? But let him ask, uh, without any faith, um, without any doubting, but with full faith. Why? Because God will give it to those who ask Him without any doubting. He will give it to them liberally. But let him ask in faith without doubting. For the one who doubts, it's like the wave of the sea tossed to and fro by the wind. We have to be solidly asking, okay, I'm giving my life to the Lord. Now, if I'm doing that, if He allows me to suffer, and I ask Him why, then I need to be willing to take that answer. Throughout his epistle, Peter gave his readers a higher view of God's purpose for suffering. Chapter 1 through chapter 2, Peter said suffering is a part of our present salvation. I know you've not been told that, but if we are being persecuted for our faith, what is the first evidence? Okay, we have a faith that's worth persecution. What does that say about those who are not being persecuted for their faith? Maybe their faith is not worthy of persecution at all. About chapter 2, verse 11, through chapter 3, verse 22, Peter said, suffering is a part of our present situation. Not only are we not going to get out of it unless we die, beloved, it's going to increase until we die. And it may increase to our death, as it is doing in about 50 countries around the world today. 200 million strong of our brothers and sisters live in areas where they don't know whether they'll see sundown or not. But if they don't see sundown on this earth, they'll see the glory of the Lord in heaven. Now, as we come to chapter 4, verse 1 through chapter 5, as we close out this first epistle, Peter said, God is using our suffering to prepare us to live in the light of the Lord's return for us, meaning the uh, imminent rapture of the church, and also then our return with Him to establish His kingdom upon this earth for a thousand years and then the new heaven and the new earth forever, world without end. So pick up reading with me in chapter 4, verse 1, if you will. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetimes in doing the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lewdness and lust and drunkenness and revelries and drinking and parties and abominable idolatries. In regards to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They'll give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be serious and watch in your prayers. Above all things have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak of the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and forever. Amen. Now, I want to ask you to do something. Would you whisper a prayer right where you are, in the privacy of your own pew, and would you pray that the Holy Spirit would anoint the preacher and the hearer? Because what we're about to cover, 
some very, very significant issues today. Okay, just go ahead and whisper that prayer right now. Peter said to maintain our Christian witness in an increasingly wicked, hostile world, we must develop two distinct attitudes of life. These are the most important things I've ever said from any pulpit. Number one, live each day with the mind of Christ. Live each day with the mind of Christ. Look in chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same mind also. Let me go back and ask you to think about Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Listen to this carefully. Paul wrote, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself, made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God highly exalted him and gave him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Christ Jesus is the Lord to the glory of God the Father." Now let me put the two together, here's what you have. The bottom line is this, as Christians we are the chosen children of God. We might call us the kids of His kingdom, as I called our youth, uh, children's ministry years ago, kids of His kingdom. However, yes we want to go out there as children of God, yes we want to go out there as kids of His kingdom, but if we're going to face the world with the mind of Christ, we must remove the robe of our royalty when we get out there, clothe ourselves as commoners, and humble ourselves as servants, even to those whom we know are going to use us and abuse us. Because that's exactly what Christ did for us to obtain our salvation. And if Christ is in me, then that's the attitude I've got to take out there. Jesus did not renounce His deity. Oh, no, no, uh-uh. But by becoming a man, he, in essence, or in effect, denied it. He laid it by, if you will. He laid it aside so he could suffer as a man. But as God, he could suffer for the sins of all men. But he had to have a human body to do that. So he had to lay his deity aside. Just like you and I have to lay our royalty aside. Yes, we're children of the king. It's already settled. Nothing can have separated us from the love of God. Number two, Jesus lived a pure and righteous life. You would think if there's anybody in the world who... If everybody would have respected, why well, here is a man who lived a pure and holy life. Not on your life. He suffered persecution every day. He bore the humiliation, the ridicule, the mockery, the beatings, even death. How? In obedience to the Father to save us from our sins. First Peter chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. Peter said we're to, to, do, the, we're, we're to do the same thing. We're, we're to go out into the world and do the same thing. We're to have the mind of Christ. Arm ourselves. Meaning, I deliberately and intentionally, just like I put on my coat or my shirt or my shoes, I put on, I arm myself with the mind of Christ. So that we don't go out and waste our time in the lust of the flesh trying to avoid suffering. But rather living each day according to the will of God. And if it includes suffering, then so be it. Because we know that if we have dedicated ourselves unto the Lord, if He allows suffering in our life, then He's got it for, for what purpose? For our good and for His glory. Now, to achieve that level of righteousness, we've got to kind of dust off the biblical definition of the word sin. And sin is a word we hardly hear anymore, right? Sin is an offense against God's law. It denies, it's anything that denies or in any way diminishes the value of who we are as human beings created in the image of God. If I use somebody else for my blessing or my satisfaction, then I have diminished the value of that person created in the image of God. If I in any way discount that person, then I've discounted that person as created in the image of God. Augustine of Hippo said, quote, sin is a word, a deed, or a desire in opposition to the eternal law of God. Now there are sins of attitude like bitterness and anger and hatred and lust and envy and jealousy. And there are sins of action like drunkenness or fornication or adultery or uh, stealing or killing or blaspheming God or blaspheming, blaspheming, uh, blaspheming those who are made in the image of God. There are sins of neglect. Failure to assemble with God's people is a sin. Failure to obey a clear command of Scripture is a sin. Failure to pray, failure to study God's Word, 
failure to love one another, failure to, uh, for husbands to love their wives, and failures of wives to obey their husbands, failures of fathers and mothers to be the parents to their children they, they need to be, failures of sons and daughters to be to their parents what they need them to be, failure to meet the needs of others when it's within our ability to do so, all those are sins. Those sins of attitude, they're sins of action. Now, as we went down that list, I'm sure we all had a bit of conviction there because we know we all have, what, fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned, and we continue to fall short of the glory of God. How do we get by that? How do we keep from participating in those same sins again? Well, let me clear up a couple of things here. While self-discipline is necessary, it's woefully inadequate to overcome our sin nature. Sometime when you have a moment, read the seventh chapter of Romans, and you'll find a picture of yourself. Paul said, well, uh, the things I want to do, I find myself I can't do. The things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. That's the Apostle Paul, perhaps one of the most disciplined men who have ever walked the face of the earth other than Christ. He said, I can't do that. Who will deliver me from the body of this death? How about, um, well, second, while guilt is beneficial. So um, uh, self-discipline is necessary, but guilt is beneficial, but... Again, guilt alone is not going to keep us from following the desires of our sin nature. Think about um, David up there on his patio at night looking down upon Bathsheba taking a bath. He knew that was wrong. He knew that was somebody else's wife. He knew exactly what was going to happen as a result of that sin, but he chose to do it anyway. So how do we do it? Well, listen to James. James 1, verse 12 and following. Listen to this. Blessed is a man who endures temptation. You mean endures temptation. Why? For when he's been approved, in other words, if he, doesn't, if he doesn't take into the temptation, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is full grown... It brings forth death. Did you get the pattern? Did you catch that pattern here? Now watch this carefully. First, there's a temptation. Here's a piece of chocolate about, you know, an inch square over here. And I'm a chocoholic and I don't want a cure. So here, there's a lust and desire. I want that chocolate. I want that chocolate. Oh, that chocolate will be so good. Third, if that desire is fulfilled, I just sinned. I just sinned. Fourth, that sin brings forth death. Not necessarily physical death, not even eternal separation from God, because all sin can be forgiven except one. That's the rejection of Jesus Christ as the God sent Savior. However, that sin may bring forth a death of a relationship. It may bring forth a death of a marriage. It may bring forth a death of a family. It may, in some cases, bring forth physical death. Sin will always take you farther than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. It will cost you more than you want to pay. Of all things, of all the people, that quote is attributed to Ravi Zacharias, the great apologist whose testimony, witness, and international ministry in the last few months has been destroyed by his own sin. And now his family and those who work with Ravi will suffer not only for his sins, his sinful actions, but for their sin of neglect in confronting Ravi with his sins and in exposing his sins to those who are in charge of his ministry. Sin will always take you farther than you want to go, cost you more than you wanted to pay, and keep you there longer than you wanted to stay. Ask David. Beloved, if we're to arm ourselves with the mind of Christ, we must evaluate every sin first through the heart of God. Like a father is hurt by the disobedience of his children, so our Heavenly Father is hurt when we fall short of the glory which He has entrusted to us. Psalm 51, after Nathan confronted David with his adultery, David cried out, Against thee, the only have I sinned. Yes, he sinned against Bathsheba. Yes, he sinned against Uriah. Yes, he sinned against the whole kingdom that was under his charge. And as a result of that, Uriah died and the firstborn son died. But he says, my sin is against thee and the only. All sin is against God. And each time we sin, we go against God's will. We deny his deity. We reject his sovereignty. We question his authority. 
In our heart of hearts, we know what we are about to say or do is wrong, but we think by saying it or doing it, it's going to bring us satisfaction, it's going to bring us pleasure, and it may do that temporarily, but in the end, it only brings forth death. 1 Samuel 15, 23, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry. Whew. And no matter how innocent our sin may seem to us, if it's an act of rebellion against God, it diminishes the glory which He has entrusted to each one of us. So the next sin, the next piece of chalk that is out there, evaluate that in terms of the heart of God. Number two, second, we must evaluate that sin to the suffering of Christ. Of course, the greatest suffering Jesus endured for us was for our sin upon the cross. 1 Peter 3, 18, Christ suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God. But that wasn't where sin began to attack Jesus, no, no. From the day He was born, Satan inspired men to kill the very one whom God had sent to be our Savior. Think about it. King Herod ordered all the male children under two years of age around in and around the city of Bethlehem to be slaughtered in order to get rid of the one that, the, by the way, the Magi told him there's a new king, and there's a newborn king being, being born right now. And so he had all the, the, the male babies under the age of two slaughtered in and around Bethlehem, about 14,000 of them. Satan tried to kill Jesus during his 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. And after he launched his earthly ministry, the Jewish religious leaders hounded him to death. They, would, they determined in the first month or two of his ministry to kill Jesus. And albeit ordained of God, they carried that out at the end of his life. They murdered him on the cross. Jesus never sinned, but the Bible says he was made to be sin. God placed the, the pain of my sin on Jesus. God, God placed the shame of my sin on Do I want to continue to place the blame and the shame of my sin upon the one who died for me? No, take the chocolate and put it back in the cabinet. Take it away. Third, we must evaluate that sin through the suffering of man. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3. But we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. And if you want to write out by the word Gentiles, it's called sinful man. We, we spend enough of our time following the pattern set forth by the casual, comfortable Christians and the sinful people. When we walked in lewdness and lusts and drunkenness and revelries and drinking parties and abominable idolatries. Where did, where did they get those who participated? Where did they get those who participated in all those events? Where did they get them? Where did they get us? What was there beyond that momentary pleasure except the pain of conviction after it was all over? What has sin done and what is it doing now to unborn babies still in their mother's womb? What has sin done and what is it doing to the minds and bodies of innocent boys and girls when we blur the difference and the uniqueness with which God has created them? What has sin done and what is sin doing to marriage and families when we say, that, oh, there's no biblical definition of marriage? Beloved, as, as Peter asked in verse 3, haven't we had enough of that stuff? Haven't we had enough of that which brought shame and sorrow and suffering to the heart of God? Haven't we had enough that brought shame and pain to the body of Jesus Christ and to the bodies of, and of the souls of every living human being? Have we not had enough sin? Have we haven't had enough of lust and lewdness and drunkenness and revelries and parties and abominable idolatries? You say, what's an abominable idolatry? It's taking the time that we said belonged to God and using it to worship some sporting or some other event where you should have been in the house of God. It's taking your time and His tithes away from Him. And beloved, that's a sin. You may enjoy it, but it is a sin nonetheless. Because when a person is truly saved, <laughs> when a person is truly saved, whatever else it means, whatever else they may be saying, it's saying this. It's saying, I've had enough of sin. I've had enough of that. I've had a belly full of it. I'm full of it. I don't want any more of it. I'm going to turn and walk away from it. They want God's forgiveness. They want to be pure. They want God's deliverance. They want to be free. 
They want, to be, they want to put their dark past behind them, and they want to live in the bright future where sin no longer controls them. And you know, beloved, they want to see somebody who's there so they can follow your footsteps. That's true repentance. That's true conversion. And God is sending us out of here today to mark the pathway for those who want to be there. Yesterday they lived to satisfy their lusts. Today they lived to please the Lord. Yesterday they had the admiration of those who were bound in their sin. Today they're persecuted by those who once said they were their friend. What about you, sir? What about you, ma'am? What about you, teenager? What about you, young child? Have, have you had enough of sin? Have you, had, have you had your full of it yet? Is it repulsive to you yet? Are you ready to turn and walk away from it? If you are, call me. I'll help you. Not until you do. Now, before we look at our second point, I want to address the issue that Peter raised in verse 1 that's caused a lot of consternation. Let me see if I can answer it for you. Peter said, for he had suffered in the flesh, has ceased from sin. What does that mean? Well, the bottom line is when we suffer painful consequences for our sins, we might decide, well, I don't think I want to do that anymore. And so we, we cease from that sin, but that doesn't mean that we cease from sin. However, just as Christ's battle against sin and his victory over sin was settled at the cross, so will our fight against sin, both inward and outward, be settled at our death. And watch this because it's a two thing. It's our death to sin. If I'm dead to sin, then uh, what's your name on the billboard makes no difference to me. And when I die, I'm dead to that billboard anyway. So if I'm dead to sin or death from this world, I've ceased to sin. But until I am, I'm going to be alive to sin. We still have a sinful nature. If I'm persecuted for my commitment to Christ or for my decision to live a holy life, and that persecution leads to my death, so be it. Why? Because while they can destroy the body, they cannot destroy my soul. All they have done is destroy my battle, give me victory over my battle with sin. So if you walk by my casket and you see my open body, you can see his victory has been won. His battle is over. His victory is won. Number two, we've got to hurry. Look in, in chapter 4, verse 7. Live each day in the anticipation of Christ. In other words, live each day with the mind of Christ. Live each day in the anticipation of seeing Christ face to face. How should we live so as to be in the will of God until God calls us home? In these five verses, we have a pattern, an example, an illustration of true discipleship. It's talking about the Christian life, a life overflowing with the Holy Spirit, a life that's going to make a difference in somebody else's life. And I want to divide it into five little actions here, yet still under the theme of how to live with the mind of Christ and how to live with the anticipation of seeing Christ the next moment. Number one, live seriously. Look at verse 7. The end of all things is at hand, therefore be serious. Peter said, in light of the uh, imminency of the coming of Christ, we ought to get serious about living lives of holiness. And some of, you are, some of you are wanting to do that, but you're kind of afraid to break away from the crowd. Break away. Break away. Break away. The Greek word translated in here does not mean cessation or termination, but rather it means consummation or culmination. And we're nearing the end of this age. Uh, we're nearing the end of this phase of God's plan for our redemption. There will be a next phase to follow. But we are at the end of this phase. Now I realize there are those who claim to be Christians who don't believe this. But beloved, the New Testament is replete with warning after warning after warning to stay prepared to hear the call of the Lord. Romans, uh, uh, Revelation chapter 4 verse 1, come up hither. Let me give you just one of these. It's Romans 13, 11. Knowing the time, it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness. There are those two words again. Not in lewdness nor lust. There's those other two words again. Not in strife or in envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. So Paul and Peter agree, live each day, saying this may be the day that we meet the Lord face to face. Since Jesus ascended back into heaven 2,000 years ago, Christians of every generation have lived in the expectancy of hearing that call. And again, I know there are those who differ with me on this over the timing of it, but listen, unless, unless the rapture of the church occurs before the tribulation, then 
there's no imminence there. There's no expectation of, of his imminent return. You say, how so? Well, listen. Those who believe the rapture will occur either some part during the tribulation or at the end, well, once we see the plagues, once we see the uh, rivers turn to blood, once we see the, all the devastation of revelation, oh, I, I believe Jesus Christ is near, so I'll get my life ready. No, there's no imminency there. There's no expectation, see. You have to live in the imminency of His return. Number two, live prayerfully. Be serious and watchful in your prayers. If we truly believe we were living in the last hour of the, the last minute of the last hour of this day, I think we'd change the way we're going to spend the next few moments, would it not? We'd become more serious about our prayer life. If we really believe we were at the end of the age, we'd be kind of uh, making a list of those that we think aren't ready, and boy, we'd be bearing down in prayer for those, would we not? Let me encourage you to make a list of those the Lord brings to your mind who may not seem to be ready for the rapture. And just, uh, just get alone in your prayer closet and pray for them. And always be ready to give them a reason for the hope that's within you if they ask you about it. But pray, and pray earnestly. Number three, live lovingly. Look in verse 8. Above all things, have fervent love for one another. The persecution these Christians were enduring had taken its toll on their emotions. Their anger was running high. Their anger was kind of spilling out on those who were persecuting them, those who were trying to comfort them. And so Peter said, now remember, love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. The writer of Proverbs said it this way, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. Only God can forgive our sins, and only Christ, the blood of Christ, can cover our sins. But our love for those who are sinning, even for those who are sinning against us, may cause them to turn to God. You say, how so? But when they see us respond to their sinfulness, they see Christ in us and hopefully be drawn to Him. One thing for sure, our hateful response is only going to stir up more strife. That's the reason I can't get involved in all this political action stuff. Even though it's involving Christians, I, I just can't do it because the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. So Peter said, when the persecution gets rough and the emotions get ragged, just remember how Jesus responded to those who are persecuting Him. Let the love of God flow freely through you to them. Let us love one another fervently. Let us love one another passionately. Let us love one another even fanatically. And then verse 9, live hospitably. Live hospitably. Uh, be hospitable one to another without grumbling. <laughs> Putting the verse back in context, the severe persecution had caused many to lose their jobs, their employment, so therefore they lost their homes, lost their food. And those Christians who had food, clothing, and shelter had to kind of open up their hearts and homes to those who didn't. And uh, it, it was the right thing to do, but as those of you who've been through this know, it's, uh, it's only room for one family in one house until you begin to get on each other's nerves here. It's hard to manage two families in one house for very long. We lived at a home place when I was a kid, and it was a home place where everybody wanted to come back on the summer and spend a week a vacation, you know, in the country, in the country. Well, that was fine for them, but it wasn't fine for me because I had to go to the garden and pick the beans and shell them and cook them and everything else. So on about a fifth day of them being there, I said, Mom, it's time to get the turnip greens out for breakfast. Let's get rid of these folks and get them back to where they're going. <laughs> Peter said, listen, you open your house and you open your heart and you open your home, but you do it without grumbling. Such temporary hospitality was also needed for the new believers who were moving into the city out of Rome. They had no place to go, and there were no hotels, there were no apartment complexes. And how about for pastors and missionaries on the way to preach the Gospels? There was no place for them to stay. So these people had to open their homes, and Peter says, do it without grumbling. Do it because God has blessed you with the ability to do it. Linda and I have blessed, been blessed by such hospitality over the years, especially in our preaching ministry in England. We were just flabbergasted and floored at the hospitality shown to us there especially by one dear precious lady who had dedicated her house to such a ministry there. She says, uh, I, I've dedicated my house to the Lord. God's servants can come through. I will feed them and I will shelter them because that's my part in whatever God's going to do with them and through them after they leave my home. And we have been blessed by that particular hospitality. Finally, live graciously. Look in verse 10. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. 
Now maybe one of these days we can address the study of the spiritual gifts. I'd love to do that. But suffice it to say, as Peter said here, the very instant we are born again, we are also enabled with a unique spiritual gift. And, it, and, and it's been given to us to do one thing, to edify and to build up and to enrich and strengthen the body of Christ. Not to draw attention to ourselves, but to build up the body of Christ. Said the majority of Christians never even are aware of that spiritual gift. And Satan's got them bound down in doing works of the flesh. Uh, they don't know how to use it, much less how it can be used for others. But as the persecution of Christians rises, you know what's going to happen? The organizational structure of the church is going to be torn down. And as the needs of the body of Christ begin to surface, the spiritual gifts are also going to surface because like a mama running to a crying baby, when, when, when the Holy Spirit prompts you to meet that need, if that's your gift, you, nobody can keep you back. You're going to run towards it. You're going to run towards it. That's why the church in Iran, the church in China, the church in North Korea, the church in other communist countries, that's why they're growing. Why? Because there's no organization. There's no, there's no structure. There's no core leadership. There's no buildings, no budgets. Just an organism. There's a body of believers. And as each one has need, the other reaches out and meets that need. Go back to Acts chapter 2, 3, and 4. And who are, they're willing to use their gift to glorify the body of Christ. Now look at the last line of verse 11. We'll close. That in all things, that in all things, one more time, that in all things God, not the church, not a denomination, but that all things God may be glorified. Through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. And all God's people said what? Remember, Peter's letters are to those Christians who were being persecuted for their expressed faith in the person and the work of Christ. Expect it. Live each day then with the mind of Christ. Take off the robe of royalty. Don the clothing of commoners. Go out there and humble yourself to the whom you know will use you and abuse you and misuse you. Because that's what they did to Christ. And live each day with the expectation this may be the moment when I meet my Savior face to face. Live always in that, in that expectation. Don't ever always stay caught up on your I love you's because like the woman in the ran said, we don't know when we leave in the house in the morning if we'll be able to come back at night. And then let me ask you a question. Does that describe your life today? If not, would you make the changes necessary to make it happen? Should the rapture of the church happen today, would, would you be ready to, to have that face-to-face -face meeting with Christ? Or is there something that you need to get settled before you meet with Him and have to give an account unto Him for that which He wants you to confess today? 1 Peter 3, 17 to 18. Since you know this, since you know this, 2 Peter, I'm borrowing from 2 Peter here. Since you know this, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but instead grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, that's enough. God bless you. Let's pray together. Father, so much we have covered today. I pray that you would take the feeble efforts of this human preacher, anointed by the Holy Spirit, make it applicable, meaningful, beneficial to those who have heard it with spiritual ears. Lord, may you raise up those who are willing to stand for you, not in boastful, arrogant action and anger and vitriol at those who are creating the crime and the confusion and the persecution. No, 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 no. But with the love of Christ for a sinful world. For God so loved the sinful world that He gave His only begotten Son, not to condemn the world, but that through Jesus Christ, the hostile world that was against Him might be saved. Father, may we walk out of this room with the same attitude. Let us so love the world, even as hostile as it is, evil as it is, that we would be willing to die to ourselves in order that somebody might see that, see Christ in us, and maybe be drawn to see the iniquity of this world and the freedom that can only be found in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Father, deliver us from evil, deliver us from carnal, casual, comfortable, cultural Christianity. Draw us so close to you that there's not even a breath between us. 
May we be willing to sacrifice whatever is in the way of that personal, intimate relationship with you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said. Y'all did such a